No. No, no. I, I don't. I don't uh, take attendance. Jen May. <coughs> Oxygen is uh, carried in two different fashions from the lungs to the tissues. That which is dissolved in plasma, which we've already talked about, the PO2, the partial pressure, the oxygen tension, if you will, and that which is attached to hemoglobin, which we're going to call the saturation denoted by the letter S. Let's talk about dissolved first. We know that as oxygen comes across from the alveolus into the um, pulmonary capillary, across that alveolar capillary membrane, it stays as a dissolved element going into the, the, the plasma, the whole Henry's, Graham's, diffusion, fixed law, that. We express that then as a partial pressure in the arterial system, we said it's 80 to 100. Venous values, we said it's about 40. It's got a range here, about 35 to 45, but 40 is still fine. How much can dissolve? is dependent upon a, upon a couple different factors, one of which uh, has to do with how soluble it is based upon Henry's law. And the number that you'll need to factor in here is 0 0.003 milliliters of oxygen will dissolve in 100 milliliters of blood. Okay. This term, milliliters per 100, 100 milliliters of blood, is also known as volumes percent. Why, I do not know, but that's the unit of measurement that we end up getting. Okay. So if you ever see milliliters per 100 milliliters of blood, you can just interpret that as volumes per cent. So what we're doing here is we're quantifying how much oxygen is being transported in a dissolved state. If my PO2 is 100, all I do is I multiply that 100 times 0 .003 and I get 0.3 volumes per cent, 0.3 milliliters per 100 milliliters of blood. French? Greek? Anything but English. Anything but English. Very good. Okay. We just want to quantify it. Okay. So we can say, are we transporting a sufficient amount from the, from the lungs to the tissues? Because if we don't, then we got a problem. Okay. But a very, it's a very small amount that is transported as dissolved. Okay, and it's linear. For every millimeter mercury PO2 you increase, you transport 0 0.003 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood more. There's no, no magic to it. Put more in the bloodstream, transport more. Unfortunately, that's not sufficient for life. If we were a unicellular organism like a Amoeba, we could get by with, with that, but we're not. We need to transport a heck of a lot more than 0.3 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood. And we need some kind of magical substance that not only will carry it, but when it gets to its destination, let's go of it. So it's got to be able to be chemically combined and chemically uncombined. Is that a word? I don't know unjoined when the time comes. Voila, hemoglobin. That magical substance that binds with oxygen in a reversible fashion. Cool part is, and we'll find this in module H, it also bonds with carbon dioxide. And it's a key buffering agent, a key neutralizer of loose hydrogen ions. So hemoglobin is, is, like a, is like really cool as far as substances go. 
Okay. We know that the hemoglobin is found in the erythrocyte. Um, and we focus primarily as adult hemoglobin. We're going to call it hemoglobin A. And I think we talked about this previously. It's partially this globulin, the amino acid, two, diff two, two different types of, of um, amino acid change, an, an, al an alpha change and a beta chain. And the four heme groups, which are iron, and the iron is in the ferrous state, the plus two state. And that hemoglobin, that heme portion of it, binds with those amino acid chains in a reversible fashion. So in the case of at the lung, oxygen plus that iron forms this compound. When we get to the tissues, it's going to re reverse that equation back and unload the oxygen. We're going to call that hemoglobin, which is saturated with oxygen, which is carrying oxygen, which has gone under this chemical reaction. We're going to call it oxyhemoglobin. What a novel idea. Okay. And it's in the ferrous state. Oh, there's a wonderful little picture. There's my uh, alpha chain and my beta chain and my heme units, which are there, the iron that it binds to. Normal hemoglobin levels, um, you'll find a bunch of different values. Um, we're going to go with the easy way. Uh, 14 plus or minus 2 for women, 15 plus or minus 2 for men. So we got a general range that we can work within. So we're going to use this one here. Uh, resides in the erythrocyte, gives it the red color, blah, 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 blah. And there are a lot of variants of hemoglobin that we'll find. One we'll talk about next semester is hemoglobin F, fetal hemoglobin, because it's totally a different structure than adult hemoglobin. But there's a bunch of, uh, bunch of different variants that are there. Hemoglobin is unique also in that it's got four binding spots, four heme units, which can carry an oxygen molecule. What's really amazing about it is once one binding spot binds with hemoglobin, or binds with oxygen, rather, the other three become far more porous and far, or far more accessible to oxygen. So when it binds, it either is totally filled with oxygen, all four binding spots are, are filled, or it's naked. It's got nothing on it. So it's an all-or-nothing proposition. Okay. <coughs> So there's, a, excuse me, my oxyhemoglobin, and we're going to call this reduced hemoglobin. Reduced meaning there's nothing there, nothing attached. That's correct. This oxygen saturation number that we talk about is really just how many of those sites are filled up versus how many sites do you have available. So if I have 80 hemoglobin molecules and they're all filled, let me rephrase that. If I have 100 hemoglobin molecules and 80 of them are totally filled up, then I have a saturation of 80%. It's just an expression of how much of that hemoglobin is full. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, pulse oximetry, um, mainly because I love talking about it, because for three, for three years it's all I did was do training on it. So it's a passion of mine. But um, it's probably one of the well, I call it the, or 
It's often referred to as the fifth vital sign. Now, if you if you work in a hospital, you'll know that no, 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 pain is the fifth vital sign. I think we should kind of call some people aside and explain to them that pain is a symptom. It's not a sign. Okay. <laughs> Cor correct. Yeah. So pulse oximetry is pretty much everywhere. You can't sling a dead cat and not find a pulse ox. I think that was probably a bad reference, but. Um, they're quite, uh, quite uh, used a lot. The problem is it doesn't tell you anything about the hemoglobin. It just tells you how much of that is saturated, not the actual amount. You could have two grams of hemoglobin, be close to death, and your saturation looks wonderful. So you've got to be careful when you're using that number. So this is, again, what we're talking about, it, all, or, all or nothing. Okay. Now, just like we had that 0 .003 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood for every tor of, of oxygen tension, what the hell did he just say? Take my PO2, multiply it by 0 .003, and that's how many milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood is being transported. For every gram of hemoglobin, we're going to transport 1.34 milliliters. Notice the difference huge amount of oxygen is transported via hemoglobin. The analogy I always uh, use is if I imagine um, the transport from the lungs to the tissues as being a crowd of people moving from the people mover to Ford Field, right? They're walking along the pavement. Well, what would make them move more, how could you move more people? Put them on buses. Hemoglobin is a bus. Hemoglobin can transport a lot more than what we can do just have people walking. So if I multiply the hemoglobin times 1.34, now I get a value of how much is being carried on that hemoglobin. Does that make sense? Just, just lie to me and nod your head. Yeah, good, okay. So 1.34 times the hemoglobin will tell me how much is carried in that fashion. 20 milliliters of oxygen for every 100 milliliters of blood. You can imagine you have a whole lot more than 100 milliliters of blood. You have something on the order of 5 liters of blood. So there's a lot that can be carried. It was a magical number that I came up with. It's, it's roughly the roughly the normal hemoglobin. Unfortunately, we said that not all hemoglobin is saturated. It's not a perfect situation. Rarely do we have a situation where the satur where the rarely do we have a situation where the saturation is 100%. The normal arterial saturation is 97 percent. The normal venous saturation is 75 percent. What did you want to know? The reason why we have something less than 100 percent is because of the small amount of shunted blood that we have. And we defined a shunt as going from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart without going through the lungs. And the one example we talked to up, up to this point in time were the Thebesian veins. The Thebesian veins is venous blood that dumps into the left atrium, thereby diluting my pristine blood coming back from the left at uh, coming back to the left atrium from the pulmonary veins bringing the oxygen saturation down a bit there's actually two other ones that are there one is the bronchial veins the bronchial veins where bronchial arteries supply the tracheal bronchial tree with our with arterialized blood or arterial blood the bronchial veins drain from the tracheal bronchial tree 
but dump back into the pulmonary veins. So they don't drain back into the normal venous pathways. Same is true with the pleural veins. They drain the pleura, but they don't drain back into a systemic vein. They drain back into the uh, pulmonary veins. So those three are examples of what we're going to call shunts. And those shunts are partially responsible for it not being 100%. Because it should be. There's no reason why we don't have that fully saturated hemoglobin present. So what we need to do is take that 1.34 times hemoglobin and multiply it by the saturation to get a better reflection of how much is being carried. Because we know that, that it's not 100% saturated. And we talked about not being bound to hem hemoglobin, not being bound with oxygen, just empty hemoglobin is being reduced. So, Yahoo, another formula, of course, because you know how much Rick loves formulas. He loves math. This is one of the important ones, though. The arterial content is basically looking at is how much oxygen in total is being carried. And it's the sum of what's dissolved and what's attached to hemoglobin. This portion here is my dissolved. This portion here is my attached. And I can do that exact same formula arterial and venous. All I do is just plug in arterial values or venous values. And I can get a CaO2 or a CVO2, where the V is the mixed venous. Did we talk about mixed venous? Mix, mixed venous blood is obtained from the pulmonary artery. Okay? So when I have that PA catheter in and I'm monitoring the pressures, I can also use that same port to draw blood back. Why the pulmonary artery? Well, the blood coming back from your head and the blood coming back from your great toe have different oxygen utilizations. The brain's going to use a hell of a lot more, hopefully, a hell of a lot more oxygen than your great toe. Okay? The blood coming back from your heart uses a lot of oxygen. The blood coming back from your liver doesn't use as much. So by the time it gets back in the pulmonary artery, it's fully mixed. So it's a global idea of what's going on. Okay? Okay, so I can calculate how much total oxygen is in the arterial system. I can calculate how much is present in the venous system. And we're going to use that to get an idea of how well we're utilizing oxygen. The last one there is one I'll put there for now, and then we'll come back and talk about later. But if you had this alve alve alveolus, this perfect, wonderful alveolar capillary exchange. The content of the blood at that point, end, end capillary, that's what the C with the little accent mark means, end capillary. Once it's all passed through or passed by an alveolus, this is the perfect alveolus. If we were dealing with ideal, perfect conditions, every bit of oxygen that was in the alveolus would be in the, arteri would be in the capillary. It's a perfect transfer. It doesn't work, but you get the idea. And it's 100% saturated. So if you'll notice, this saturation is 100%. Every bit of hemoglobin you could possibly have is filled up. 
There is no l mixture of bad blood. We're 100% saturated. We're fully transferred from the alveolus into the bloodstream. And instead of using PAO, P small a or PVO2, I'm using the alveolar air equation value. So every bit of oxygen in the alveolus gets across, and when it gets across, it all goes onto the bus and it's totally filled. The perfect exchange. Obviously theoretical, because you can't really measure this unless you figure out a way to crawl into somebody's pulmonary capillary. It could happen. Okay. Very important calculation. Because if I have problems oxygenating, if I have problems where my tissues are dying because they're not getting enough oxygen, we go to the oxygen content. Which one's screwed up? Is it my hemoglobin? Is it my saturation? Is it my PaO2? One of them's out of whack in most cases. Oh. Let me start with this and then we'll take a little bit of a break because I need some more coffee. And you need to let it settle in the brain just a bit. This is not on the test next week, by the way. We know that, right? We have a test next week? Oh, yeah. All right, remember the relationship between partial pressure and oxygen? It was linear. PO2, oxygen transport, linear, linear relationship. Now with hemoglobin, sorry, it's not so pretty. You may have covered this, I'm guessing, in, in A and P. Yes? Somewhere along the line? No. Good. Then I don't have to unbreak any bad habits. I can, we can start from scratch. It is what, we, what we're going to call a sigmoidal curve. It looks like a, well, I don't want to say it looks like your sigmoid colon, because it doesn't, but it's an S-shaped curve. Can you kind of get an S out of that a little bit? kind of, sort of. It's a noodle. It's not straight. However, within physiological, within the range in which we live, it actually is two lines. There's a line going there, the steep portion of the curve, and there's a line there, which is far more flat. Agreed? Steep. Flat. Okay. What what is the no if, if this on the bottom is PO two? This is PO two. This is SO two. I didn't say a uh, arterial or venous because it's both. We're running the gamut here of everything from venous blood to arterial blood. What is the normal PaO2? 80 to 100. So it's in this range here. I don't think I can draw this straight. Oh, not bad, Rick, not bad at all. Okay, so this is the normal arterial range. If you look at the saturation that it falls in there, it's a very narrow range. So our saturation in the arterial system is pretty close to 97% and doesn't vary much beyond that. What's our normal veno... What's our normal venous oxygen level? 35 to 45, roughly around 40. So in this range here.
and it's going to yield a saturation of about 75 percent, where this is about 97 percent. So in the Venus world, we're living in the steep part of the curve. When I come back to the lungs and become arterialized, right? I'm living on the flat part of the curve. Can, can you visualize that concept? And all we're doing as we go from tissues to lungs is going back up and down this curve as we're unloading and loading. Okay, let me take a break there. Let that, I blame Jeannie. Okay. So we have a steep part and a flat part. Let's talk about the steep portion of that curve first. We're going to call this the dissociation portion. This is the part of the curve where oxygen is being given up. The relationship between iron and oxygen is lost. In theory, this is, uh, can go as low as 10. In reality, I mean, we never really get a, P, a Venus PO2 that low. But in theory, you can get it. Very important concept, the third bullet point. For every change in PO2, for every one tor change, there's a huge amount of saturation decrease that happens. So let me say this in another way. As the PO2, or as the blood comes floating into your systemic capillaries, there's going to be an exchange of oxygen for carbon dioxide that happens at that point. As the PO2 begins to fall, because it's going into the tissues, the bus door opens and a bunch of people get off. And for every one person that walks in, there's three, four, five, six, seven of them to get off the bus and go into the plasma, and they go into the tissues, and more people get off. So as you start decreasing PO2, you have a big drop in saturation. Small change PO2, big change in saturation. That's what you want. You want the hemoglobin to unload. And as the PO2 falls along that steep part, starting at about 60, you start seeing a big drop off. So 60 is the, the PO2 of 60 is the beginning of the steep part of the curve. And we're going to find that's a real important number to watch. Small change in PO2, big change in SO2. I start desaturating as the PO2 starts falling. Gets to 60 and there's a little bit of a drop. 60, go to 50, go to 40, big drop. That's what's causing an unload. Think about it. How long do you have to do this loading and unloading? Not a lot of time. What's the transit time? About a three quarters of a second. It's sitting in front of a systemic capillary. Same as it is in the lungs. Same is true systemically. So where I had to fill it up really quick, I got to unload it really quick. How am I doing? Okay, so as, as the, what happens at the capillary is that the oxygen's being depleted, pulled into the tissues to be utilized, and, and, and what ends up happening as the PO2 falls, saturation falls with it, but at a much faster rate. At the flat portion, which is what happens at the lungs, Small changes, I'm sorry, large changes in PO2 are followed only by a very small change in saturation. 
What this means is that going from a PO2 of 90 to a PO2 of 95, saturation doesn't change much at all. Once you're full, you're full. And that's what happens at the lungs is we have this rapid increase in saturation. If I have a venous PO2 of 40 coming back, that's on the, that's on the steep part, as I increase that, PO2, as oxygen comes across the alveolus into the capillary, saturation is going to rise very quickly, and at some point it's just going to kind of taper off. It's not going to be that big of a change anymore. So what this means is having somebody with a PO2 of 300, in most cases, doesn't make any sense because you're not going to carry any more hemoglobin, any more of it on hemoglobin, I should say. Diminishing returns at that point. Steep part, big change in saturation for a small change in PO2. Flat part, no, not so. Flat part, big change in PO2 yields a very small change in saturation. So they're kind of opposites. And if you look at the fact that I have a steep part and a flat part, the slope of the, oh God, there's that math again. The slope of those lines are drastically different. Okay, let's go back in, uh, this is an example of what you might see a question on the test. So if I wanted to calculate this, This is my formula. How much is dissolved? How much is attached to hemoglobin? times 1.34 times 0.95, that first part. 12.7? That. So it ends up being 13.03. Uh, Five percent. And you can pretty well guarantee that it, you'll see that kind of a question. Not on Wednesday or Thursday, but next time. Okay? So if we looked at a Venus PO2, it's about a saturation of 75. Venus P, P, uh, PVO2 of 40 correlates with a saturation of, uh, we said, about 75%. And an arterial value of about 100 is about 97%. So there's kind of how they work. And like I said, we just kind of go back and forth between those two as we load and unload hemoglobin, or load and unload oxygen from the hemoglobin. 60 is the key part. 60 is the point at which that steep part starts. So one of the things we'll always strive for is to keep somebody's PO2 above 60. Because once they fall below that, then we have a rapid deterioration, or let's say deterioration, we have a rapid desaturation that occurs. Smaller change in PO2, big change in saturation. Okay. So although PO2 contributes very little to the oxygen content, 
we go back here, when we calculate our oxygen content, who's contributing the most? Dissolved or attached? Well, attached is by a huge amount, 12.73 versus 0.3. So the PO2 really doesn't contribute much to the actual transport. However, it's critically important because it impacts how much the saturation is. Okay. But I'm just summarizing. We already talked about that. Okay. 60 to 100 is the flat part. And 40 is what is at the tissues. And that's, on, at, uh, that's in the steep part. Okay. You got this one? Okay, good. We've talked about these, uh, some, some of these values. Venus PO2, steep part of the curve. Look at the point at which we have a half our hemoglobin saturated. It's way down there. And we don't really get 100% saturated until we get the PO2 drastically high. So clinically, that's not something we're going to end up seeing. This is something that you'll want to commit to memory. It's very difficult. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. It's just a quick, easy, fancy way to remember what saturation is associated with what PO2. A PO2 of 40 is about 75, actually, but 40, 50, 60, 75, 80, 90 sounds weird. PO2 of 60 correlates to a saturation of 90. 50 is around 80% saturated. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. All right. Theoretical thing. So it's not something you're ever going to calculate. It's not something you're ever going to technically measure. Do they, do, do they report P50 on your blood gas results? Mm, I don't know. I know you, uh, okay. Chances are they don't. Because it, it, would, it, would, it would not be a measured value, it would just be a calculated value. This is saying, what's the PO2 when my saturation is 50%? And the normal value is 27. Probably should know that. The only useful thing that we have. Now here's the problem with that oxyhemoglobin curve. Remember I told you it's got this S shape we're a flat part and a steep part. Well, the curve, the curve wiggles. It moves. It's like a noodle. It shifts and changes position. Really? Really, Rick? Yeah, really. When it shifts to the left, that P50 actually becomes less than 27. When it shifts to the right, it becomes greater than 27. It's more theoretical than, than valuable, but the shifting is definitely valuable. So let's talk about a leftward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. That's what OHDDC stands for. A left shift. So that means that if this is my curve, it's doing this. It's shifting to the left. Follow me so far. It's wiggling left. Well, when it shifts to the left, I have 
increased affinity between hemoglobin and oxygen. This is what we expect to happen at the lungs because we want to facilitate loading of oxygen onto hemoglobin. Let me say that again. At the lungs, what do you want? You've got a very short amount of time to fill that hemoglobin. Well, it would be really great if they just kind of fell in love and they were so attracted to one another that the process of loading sped up. This increase in PO, um, this increase in affinity means that for a given PO2, we have a higher saturation than normal. What did I say the norm? Oh God! What did I say the normal PaO2 at 60? What's the normal saturation? 90. 90. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Right? If I measured my PaO2 as 60, but my saturation was 93%, I would say I have a leftward shift. I have a higher amount of saturation than I would expect to see for that PO2. It means the curve gets more steeper. It gets more steeper, sure. Left, love, lung. When a shift happens to the left, the affinity for oxygen and hemoglobin goes up, and this is what happens at the, at the, at the lung. There are many things, actually there's four, that we're going to focus on that cause a leftward shift. And if you'll notice, they're all resulting in a, something being going down in, in quantity. It's lower. A fall in hydrogen ion concentration, a fall in temperature, a fall in carbon dioxide, and a fall in something called 2,3-DPG. Decrease, lower, left, love, lung. Leftward shift. Facilitates loading of oxygen onto hemoglobin. Wiggles left. Is there a right shift? You betcha. What happens here is the opposite. Hemoglobin looks at the oxygen molecule and says, who the hell are you? Get off my bus. I don't love you anymore. This is divorce court, I guess. This is what you want of tissues. You want to have rapid unloading. And this is accomplished by the, the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen being, being reduced. This would be an example where I have a PO2 of 60 and a saturation of 87. It's lower than expected. It's not carrying as much as it should be. And just like those things fell on a shift to the left, they all rise on a shift to the right, or what I say is upright. As I shift to the right, hydrogen ion concentration goes up, temperature goes up, carbon dioxide, let me rephrase that. As temperature goes up, we have a rightward shift. As carbon dioxide level goes up, we have a rightward shift. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's think of our alveolus here. What is... Uh, carbon dioxide in the, the, uh, on the venous side of a alveolus, about 46. Arterialized 
It's about 40. So I have a drop in, in CO2. As I have a decrease in CO2, I have an increased affinity, which would be a leftward shift. That's what you want. At the tissues, I have my, v, my PO2 of 40 going to a PO, P, PACO2, PVCO2 going the opposite direction. It's increasing. As, I drew that the wrong way. As CO2 leaves and comes into the bloodstream, you have an in, increase in CO2. which is going to cause a rightward shift. Yes. There's a question there. So when your relationship with the peak is seed, is that important when that's going to be Like, do you want it to shift left? Is that right? Depends where I'm at. If I'm at the lungs, I want it to shift to the left. If I'm at the tissues, I want it to shift to the right. If the P50 confuses you, don't worry about it, because that, that's more of a theoretical thing than a, than a reality. But what we're saying is that that curve is wiggling. I don't know why I like to use that word wiggle, but it, it, it fits. So you want the lungs to shift to the left? At the lungs, I want it to shift to the left. At the tissues, I want it to shift to the right. And magically, that's what ends up happening. In theory, you could think of the, the tissues as being warmer than the lungs are because there's metabolic activity going on creating heat. There's not that at the lungs. Um, there's a higher amount of carbon dioxide at the tissues than at the lungs. So there's a leftward shift at the lungs and a rightward at, at, at the tissues. I'm trying to think of how else I can give you an analogy on that. Ah, yes. Egan. Remember Egan? If the middle line is the normal point, when I have a shift to the left, you can see how it has that little bit of a wiggle. And if we were to truly look at the 50% saturation point, it'd be lower than what the normal value is for what it's worth. My P50 goes down as I shift to the left. What is important is what causes it. Fallen hydrogen ions, which we'll find is called alkalosis, a fall in PCO2, a fall in temperature, and a fall in the substance 2,3-DPG, which nobody understands. Shift to the right. is an elevation in all of those things and it means we have less affinity, less love. Okay. I think we should stop there because your brain hurts. Susan says, yeah, hello. <laughs>